In this conversation, I talk with Teddy Rackevelt. Teddy is someone that I found on Twitter recently, and I really enjoyed the way that he was participating online. And so in this conversation, I begin by sharing what drew me to him and what I appreciated about him and his participation. And then we branch out into a lot of different topics about religion, Christianity, society, culture, government. And it was a fascinating conversation. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I hope you will too. Oh, welcome, Teddy. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, glad to be here. So I think the best place to start would be just to share a little bit about where I'm coming from and why I wanted to talk to you today. Um, so I've only been following you on Twitter for you know a few weeks or a month or something like that, but um, something really stuck out to me about the way that you were engaging on Twitter. And I feel like that would be a good basis for our conversation just to start there about what drew me to the way you were participating online. Um, yeah, sure. Cool. So you've been having this thread on Sundays where you say, uh, dudes and ladies, tell me about your W's, your wins, you know, and yeah. uh, people have this chance to brag to you about what, what's going on in their life, to share what's happening. And, and then um, what that that's, you know, a lot of people on Twitter these days have these sort of um, engagement posts where they're like asking a question or, you know, trying to get people to mm -hmm. participate in some way. So so that in itself is not really unusual. But the thing that stuck out to me was um, uh, the way that you were replying to these, these um, what people were sharing was just very warm and sweet and, um, uh, you know, celebrating people and their victories and like cheering them on. And uh, you were just consistently coming from that place and demonstrating it in a way that was very clear and obvious to me. And it helped me personally, because from where I'm coming from, um, you know, I'm a Buddhist and the Buddhists mm -hmm. talk about the, the four Brahma Viharas, which are uh, metta or loving kindness and karuna or compassion, mudita or sympathetic joy, and then upekka or equanimity. And the one that I've cultivated the most is metta or loving kindness. But um, mm -hmm. I was interested in, in cultivating the others. And in particular, this, the way that you're manifesting yourself, demonstrating yourself, seemed to be um, in line with mudita or sympathetic joy, that when someone else was happy, you were celebrating for them, you were happy for them, and you were fully embodying that, as far as I could tell. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that as kind of a basis for a conversation about what drew me to the way that you were participating, and and really ask you about that as a, as a starting point, and I imagine we'll venture out from there, but <clears throat> with that sort of context, can you tell me about, like, uh, yeah, why you started doing those threads and what it's been like for you and, and where you're coming from with that? Yeah, those actually, um, the story behind those posts is actually is surprisingly for the amount of thought that I put into most of, most of my tweets, which is nearly zero. Um, those tweets actually have a, a, a pretty long backstory. Mm. Um, and that backstory starts with um for a long time um i have been pretty concerned um about the state of the modern american young man mm -hmm. um and specifically specifically about him I, I i feel like the modern um the modern young man is is pretty lost in a in a society that sort of i don't want to like get like too philosophical here because I'm not like <laughs> I'm not a great thinker but um there is a great tragedy in in an unmoored and un, uh, purposeless masculinity that I think you see a lot more and one of the people that addressed that uh when I was um, doing my undergrad you know was Jordan Peterson and I sort of paid attention to him but what was mo more interesting um then my own paying attention to him was the way that some of my the some of my good friends paid attention to him um and even i had some friends who had even you know i was i was christian um but they were they were christian they had good families they had strong familial attachment attachments and he still spoke to them um and his, his call for purpose and meaning um to young men specifically spoke to them in a way that no one else was really speaking to them and so 
Okay, so so I've been thinking this has sort of been percolating in the back of my head for a long time. Um, and you know, on Twitter, you have to make everything content. And so um, at some point I started doing basically, uh, so, so there's this other side, which is on Twitter specifically, I think, I, I don't wanna be like, like, I'm not doing, this is a weird thing to say, but men get dunked on a lot on Twitter. Um, and uh, it's completely understandable. I, I'm a huge dunker. I fuck around a lot on Twitter. Um, I totally get it, but I wanted to bring some of the celebrate uh, some of the way that men celebrate each other in private into the open a little bit. Um, so if you think about right, some you know if you think about the way you played sports um or if you think about a, a particularly tight-knit uh male community that you've had in the past um oftentimes those communities will both hype each other up and put each other down for like the stupidest of reasons and with unlimited energy just mm -hmm. just absolutely like anyway men are kind of dumb, but <laughs> I was, what, what I wanted to do with something like that is that I want to look at that and be like, look, this is something that we do in private that I think we could bring out into the public because it just sort of needed to be out there. Anyway, so this is like a long sort of explanation of something that ended up being quite dumb and quite simple, which was, I simply started asking men like, hey how'd you rock this week or how'd you get a w this week um and that was on my last account which i ended up getting banned because i went a little too hard on that uh but then i started to tell you about and um i wanted to bring that back but i wanted to bring it back in a way that was a little more easily recognizable and um one of the accounts that ended up getting big was the dudes uh dudes getting w's account uh, mm -hmm. And so I just basically took that notation and put it into a tweet and started getting, and I got, and I, the first time I tweeted, I got like 50 replies and it was, it was a big surprise. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really anticipate getting that much engagement, but the thing was, is that, um, when people are communicating your joy to you, and this is sort of, you know, I'm, I'm religious, I'm Christian, right? Uh, there, when people are communicating their joy to you, it's almost, uh, it's almost disrespectful to not share in that with them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. To not celebrate that with them. And one of the reasons that that is, right, is that um, that joy uh, and those blessings are given by God, right? And so to recognize those as God, uh, God-given blessings uh, or God-given gifts um, is to actually think like how much more powerful and glorious those are. Anyway, so what that ends up translating to me is me like sitting here, like tweeting out just celebratory gifs at people, you know, like pounding in my desk when I they say, you, you know, I'm married. I'm like, hell yeah, that's awesome. You're married. I was like, oh, um, you know, one of my one of my beautifuls has like this long standing uh, <laughs> this long standing uh, tradition of updating me on how his dates are going on this third every week, right? And like that, I just that's so cool, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's great that he's going on dates. I'm so happy for him. Um, so it's a it's a combination of a bunch of like weird shit that I've paid attention to over the course of my life, and then also the fact that like there's nothing better than celebrating the boys. Like it's just celebrating the boys. And then I realized, you know, I was I was leaving out the girls. The, <laughs> the girls deserve to be celebrated too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I ended up starting uh, a girls tweet as well. And you know, I think the boys are a whether this is to our credit or uh perhaps not so good can be debated <laughs> but uh the girls are maybe a little more reticent about flaunting their stuff in public mm. uh which may be the better part of wisdom or 
may be a hindrance, who knows, but um, that those tweets have been a little more, they've been a little more thoughtful, uh, not not so much hype, but that, which is fine too. It's, it's not a big problem. It's actually quite funny if you are looking for uh, differences in, in men and women going to each of those uh, threads and looking at the differences and how people reply anyway that's a really long-winded not very focused answer uh so if you have any specific questions on that yeah no no it's great it's great uh exactly what i was hoping to hear um i guess um well there's a lot of questions coming up for me but one is and and maybe this is um uh overly pointed or something but you know, sure. uh, the way I'm engaging with this right now is is sort of um, uh, in peers from different traditions, right? Like I love that you're a Christian mm -hmm. and that you have a theistic background. Like sometimes I really resonate with theistic stuff and that's been mm -hmm. very helpful to me at times. And I'm just like pretty squarely in the Buddhist stuff over here. So it's like, sure. I wanna compare notes, like what's working for you? How does that work? And sure. um, I'm wondering almost, uh, hmm, I mean, it's sort of to put it in the mudita frame of the sympathetic joy of mm -hmm. you seem to be, again, really good at embodying that and manifesting it and speaking from that place. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering of like what that's like qualitatively for you and how you step into that and um, yeah, mm. what, how, how you do that. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of modern problems can be boiled down to a lack of imagination. And a key thing for this um, is, to, is to imagine that thing, right? So someone tells me, dude, I went on a date with a great girl this week. And I put myself in their shoes. I'm like, how happy would I be had I gone on a date with a wonderful girl this week, right? Mm -hmm. um, or what? not to say that like I haven't, but how happy would I be had I like spent whole, all of COVID like alone by myself and the starting kind of to end and like I'm going on a date with this cute girl and I'm like really into her. And that allows me to be excited for them. Mm -hmm. uh, that allows me to be happy. The other thing, the other side of that, so, so I'm like really actually considering what that means to them. The other thing is, um, is so for example I spent Easter Easter weekend with my family and um, on the Friday before Easter basically since I, I have been born my parents do um, a messianic seder uh, a Passover a Passover dinner um, but couched in the fulfillment of uh, uh, Jesus Jesus' fulfillment of the the promises made to the Jews um, which is, is super powerful, uh, especially for a lot of uh, American Christians who really don't understand the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament um, in, any, in any concrete or tangible way. But all that aside, one of the great things about the Seder is that you, number one, you bring is you invite as many friends as you possibly can uh, <laughs> and as many people as you can logistically handle, uh, whether or not you're overflowing on the couches or whatever um, you do that. The other thing that you do is you cook really good food. You're, you, you have to drink as a part of the ritual, you have to drink four glasses of wine. You have to drink, you have to drain your cup every time actually. And uh, the joy that comes from bringing together community in a faith centric way uh, is really informative to the rest of your life, right? Because that, um, that is a reservoir which you can fall back upon or you can use to understand other people's joy, right? Mm. Um, it, and so uh, I also think that my own experience and my own community gives me the, the emotional and spiritual basis with which to be supportive of other people. Um, were I spiritually bankrupt, uh, or, or community wise, uh, if I, if I were not provided with a certain foundation and a certain background, I would don't think I would have the capability in order to be able to be as joyful for other people. 
um, as as I might want to be. So this, so those two sorts of things in concert, I think. Um, if that does that make sense? Yeah. So so imagination, and then also um, the like resourced being resourced by your spiritual community and connecting to that and being able to draw from that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the classic Christian saying is my uh, my cup runneth over, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're filled up with um, the joy of, of the joy and love of God, right, that naturally pours out of you to other people. Um, mm -hmm. And so that that's sort of that's the basis for all of the other <laughs> all the basis for the ways that I can try to be good are ramifications of the guy who's actually good to me first right mm. which is as you might expect for, <laughs> from my religious background which is god um, without his input first i wouldn't be able to input in that other people's lives so mm. that's beautiful thank you for sharing i mm -hmm. feel really uh moved and inspired hearing that so thank you <laughs> thanks appreciate it um you know, it, it, it's occurred to me for a while that, yeah, again, from this perspective of sort of uh, comparing notes of um, Buddhism, like, I think Christianity really has some things figured out, and I've admired that and looked to that mm -hmm. and um, think that Buddhism could draw from that. And, you know, of course, I think that um, Buddhism has things to share with Christianity and other traditions as well. And, um, but I'm curious to hear... Um, you know, partly I'm curious about your own history with Christianity, but also sure. about um, what you feel that Christianity really has going for it, almost almost from like a, um, a sociological perspective, you know, um, yeah. le less like uh, not even as much like theologically, but it really seems to have some incredible social technologies that it, at times hmm. work quite well and uh, would be curious to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, um, my own, I'll keep, I'll, I'll tell my personal story while also keeping it uh, sufficiently vague so I don't accidentally mm -hmm. dox myself. Perfect. My own relation, my own relationship with Christianity um, is actually, so I was raised obviously in a Christian family, mm -hmm. um, but growing up, I sort of, I was one of those kids who just like kind of wanted to be liked. So I just really, I got really good at it as as a um as a sort of a con job <laughs> i knew the right things to say um i knew the right attitudes to take you know i knew i actually was i was actually knew a bunch of theology um and i did it as basically a way of, of fitting in uh mm -hmm. and finding approval rather than any real acceptance and so um the first uh like i got baptized basically so people would like me better uh mm -hmm. that you know, I, I think I was like, I don't know, I was young at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, midway through high school, a, a bunch of bad things happened to me. Um, I lost most of my friends. I sort of lost my ability to play sports. Um, and it sort of, it sort of broke me identity wise. Uh, you know, and most young kids have some sort of equivalent story, but, you know, the, you know, I was depressed, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I went on this trip, uh, this like sports trip, which actually ended up being a mission trip, but I didn't know at the time. Hmm. Uh, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone on had I known. And, um, uh, there's nothing worse as a really miserable person than being around a lot of really happy people. Mm -hmm. Um, and the reason for that is because it actually call, it asks you questions and, you know, the question for me was basically, why is everyone else so happy and I'm so miserable? Mm -hmm. um, and I ended up, uh, over the course of that trip, I started out very angry at God. Um, and I ended up becoming baptized again by the end of the trip. Um, and it was, it was almost... Um, the, the reason for that was it was really because it was the only true thing uh, as the only real thing that I could see on the trip right I, I could see my own existence so I was like this sucks my own existence sucks I clearly am not 
sufficient on my own uh, to figure out what the hell is going on. So, and this seems pretty good. Um, and so then I went through the rest of the high school and like, I was nominally, I was like, okay, I, I accept this. This is true, but I wasn't really pursuing it in any real way. Um, and then in college, um, uh, I slowly but surely failed out of college and then got diagnosed with like a potentially fatal disease that, mm. uh, that had gotten undiagnosed. And, you know, I hadn't been able to figure out because had warped my head so badly that I didn't even realize that I was sick Mm. um and that was a point where I didn't have really any friends I couldn't talk to my parents because I felt like I was letting them down um I really didn't have anywhere else to turn but to but to my religion um and so that was the moment I came out of that being like, okay, this is just like really actually the only thing that can keep me going. Like, uh, life will inevitably suck. And um, you ha- when life sucks, you, you need the things that are actually true uh, during, <laughs> during, during the suck. Uh, there, are own, there are a very limited amount of things that will, that will sustain you. Um, and there was an even more limited amount of things that will sustain you in a meaningful way. Um, and then there's really only one thing that is indelible, right? So, you know, family can sustain you, friends can sustain you, but a lot of those things are sort of transient, right? You know, what happens if I lose my family, right? It's, it happens to some people. Uh, what happens if I lose my friends? It's happened to me many times, right? And, you know, a couple of times in my life, I really haven't had many friends. Um, mm-hmm. There's only one thing that's really indelible. And then there's only one thing that's really truth. Uh, and anyway, so that's sort of the the really short version of that. What was the second part of your question? Sorry, I, I sort of lost oh, track. Oh, just of it. no problem. Um, just yeah. from a like sociological perspective, what you feel? Yeah, uh, okay. Christianity has to social out. technologies. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really good question. Well, okay, so like I'm gonna I'm gonna do the cop-out answer and then I'll get to the question. The first, the first thing that Christianity has figured out is that it's true, right? People, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I actually don't think that if Christianity uh, wasn't true, there, so this is sort of a, so for a lot of like your uh, probably more rationalist listeners, this will be probably be ridiculous, but I sort of doubt that a religion like Christianity could get off the ground without it being true because it's just so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you really think about it, it's like, it's sort of, it's sort of dumb. If you think about it for the person you're like, so you're telling me that God was like, you know, I'm going to like, what is a God who has humbled himself uh, and then taken, it just, it just sounds crazy and it sounds kind of stupid. Uh, and what sounds even more ridiculous is, is and then the fact that like the entire world had never really had a religion where God, where, where, the, where the person who was celebrated um, was the loser. <laughs> uh, and so it's sort of a, anyway, so that's sort of a side chance. Christianity has a really interesting thing. I actually think that you almost need to talk about the Catholics, the Protestants separately in terms of social technologies. Mm -hmm. Um, Now I'm going to do the Catholics first. Um, The Catholics end up getting this incredible institution built. Um, and with it, they have married, they have married, so when you think about institutions, right, the usual problem with institutions usually is, is that they are inflexible. So institutions are built for usually a very specific purpose. And then over time, based on other advances, um, they will usually become, you um, irrelevant in some in some way or another and, and then they'll be abandoned right uh so 
right? The institution, the feudal institution was useful in a particular context, um, which I won't get into because number one, that's kind of outside the scope. Number two, it would take too long. But the, the feudal institution, right, is established in Europe and, and is very effective in all these different ways. And then it fades away because it just sort of the conditions upon what, which is predicated are no longer the case, right? The Catholic Church is really interesting because it marries institutional rigidity with this incredible flexibility at the practical level. And that occurs both on the institutional level and the theological level, right? Confession on the individual level is this incredible way for a church to stand up and say, you are damned. However, you're all right, right? It's this like, it's this crazy thing where the Catholic Church is not shy about being, you are really sinful and there are real things about modern culture which we view as sinful and yet you are forgiven and you're forgiven in this really super practical way. And so the Catholic Church goes, has this like really interesting flexibility on that level where sin is sort of like the most inflexible concept out there, right? Um, but the Catholic Church says, this is an inflexible problem for you. And yet this is a really practical solution um, and you are forgiven. Uh, and so forgiveness ends up being, and forgiveness more widely in Christianity, I just think the Catholics are better at applying this than the Protestants. Um, forgiveness is this great social, uh, social technology, which allows you to hold people to standards and to tell the hard truths, but also for people to be okay with that. Um, this is one of the issues, let's say, with um, with well, let's say it because intellectual culture is always so easy to bash on, right? This is sort of a problem with overly intellectual culture, is that um, in something like um, let's just say like socialism or, or communism, right? It, it's very hard. <laughs> there's no escape option for the bourgeoisie, right? There's no there's no these are your great sins, but here is the path out, right? Um, with, you know, even let's say capitalism is not really a philosophical idea. Well, it is to some extent, but let's, let's take it as a practical tool in, in moral ideas, so, right? If you say capitalism, you know, the, there's no inherent mechanism within capitalism to say, this is wrong and yet you will be forgiven. Um, so this ends up taking Christianity and making it making it flexible, but also able to communicate things which it wants to communicate, but can be really difficult, especially given, like in any culture, Christianity is going to have things that are, people are not pleased with. Um, so there's that. Um, that is a, that's a huge, I think, that's really one of the cornerstones of what makes Christianity interesting. And, and this specifically is really interesting because actually humans, I think in our corner of Twitter, we end up talking about the in-group, right? And we talk about how the in-group is like really excusing, uh, ex makes a lot of excuses for, excuses for their own faults and ends up saying, you know, these people out here, the out-group, right, they're bad. And the whole point of that is, is that, yes, actually, everyone is bad, right? Christine is like, yes, correct, 100%, but you have to forgive them. Um, and that is like, that, that is not only a great savior of community, but it's also a great challenge to preserve an open community up. Um, it's almost, Christine actually ends up being almost the the anti-in-group, out-group distinction um, while maintaining very, very, very sharp in-group, out-group distinctions. So it's a, it's a very odd sort of technology on that front. Um, the props get something interesting, right? Um, is, is they almost have a certain flexibility about them. Um, 
they, they have a flexibility and inflexibility. I think, and you can sort of see this with Christianity in general, right? Is the props end up getting this like weird piece of that. Now, to, now to be fair, Catholics and Protestants are probably closer together than a lot of people think. But if you look at the, the Protestant structure, what they end up sort of getting right is um, they end up talking, I think, a lot about um, they, they end up dealing with intellectual differences pretty well. Um, and you end up getting a lot of these sort of <laughs> disparate groups of people who are still marginally united um, under the same, and you know, this is not always the case, right? You have the religious wars back in Europe, um, but, but Prots seem to figure out this way to contain this, this splintering um, with maintaining some sort of intellectual or theological rigidity amongst themselves. Um, anyway, so so there there are a few things. Um, there's definitely more things. Uh, I, Christianity. Now, I will say, um, as I'm sure many people may have some objections right about now, right? You know, what about Joel Olstein? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, what, what do um, American, uh, you know, American Christianity, I think, is warped in some really specific ways that end up uh, taking away credence from a lot of this. And I'm, I'm, I'll readily accept that American Christianity has, has big problems. And actually, uh, big problems from ignoring its own theology. Um, but I think um, one of one of the pastors who I really appreciate is this guy, Matt Chanley, he preaches in this church called the Village Church in Texas, and he talks about radical hospitality. Uh, the Bible is pretty clear about things like hospitality um, and, and the way in which you are to practice it. Right? There's this parable about the guy who you know has this big feast i think he's a new bride and he has this big feast he invites all these like you know all of his friends super rich friends and they all like come up with excuses they can't come and so he invites in like the cripples and the beggars in the street right um and christianity like calls one of the central tenets of christianity the ways that you have to live out christianity is community building you have to be able to want to build a community um that is something that i don't think actually people understand or talk about christianity a lot um you are like you are theologically required to care for and to serve other people and that requires and the inevitable consequence of that right is the creation of community um and the Christian Christian community is a hypothetically, like let's say the platonic ideal, is a community where a bunch of people are serving one another. Um, in practice, you know, obviously in practice, you know, Christianity is happy to say, hey, we're all simple. <laughs> Never gonna work out 100 percent of the time. Um, but if you end up with a community where people are uh, really trying to serve one another and not trying to serve one another because they're trying to be good people, but trying to serve one another because it's a reflection of the way that they are called to serve, right? It's, it's, a, um, it's a calling rather than, a, uh, than an attempt to, you know, be the better version of themselves or whatever. Um, that's, a ro that's robust. That's really robust. Uh, and you can sort of see versions of this early on in the Old Testament where the, the first Christians are coming together, right? And they're, and they're coming together and they're like making these gigantic dinners for one another, like as a community. And they're sharing the food between people who have the money to pay for the food and the people who have it. And they, in fact, they elect people who are specifically, like specifically elected in order to make sure food gets distributed equally. Um, this is one of the great strengths of Christianity as well is, is that there is a there's a call for community building and especially in america i think <laughs> now the community is so uh dead 
um, this is actually ends up becoming really powerful. Um, whether or not we're, we're doing it well, that's in a whole other topic. Uh, and why or why not we might be doing it well um, is, a, uh, <laughs> is definitely a question. But anyway, but I've rambled on for a long time and um, I'm sure many people are very confused by what I was actually saying. So, so I'll turn it back over to you. Oh, well, I, I, no, no need to apologize. I'm enjoying what you're sharing. So, um, uh, and the thing that comes up for me hearing you talk is a curiosity mm -hmm. about, um, um, you know, in, in relation to what we were already talking about, about these threads that you're posting and how you're engaging online, mm -hmm. but just is, is how, I mean, given that you see a, a, a theological responsibility for yourself and Christians to build community mm -hmm. in this way, how are you acting on that sense of responsibility? What, how are you building community, and and what are you, how, how are you approaching that, and what are you, what kind of community are you trying to build? Yeah, that that's a good one. Um, community during coronavirus has been difficult. Mm -hmm. I'll say I'll say uh, this is a, an interesting question because. There are, so I ended up moving during the middle of coronavirus. Um, and it has been um, difficult to, it's been difficult to get, to do the things that I, I wish to do. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a couple ways, which I, let's say, which I plan to build community. Um, First of all, um, I'm, you know, I'm on the verge of joining a church myself. Uh, and part of the building community is actually the maintenance of community. Um, this is actually, I think, the, the great misunderstanding uh, in America is that we never transition from, uh, from power creation to power maintenance. Right. Um, and so that's, that's a geopolitical question. But this is, so this is the thing here is like by... Um, joining a church and, com and and committing myself to that particular church right which will not be perfect the people in it will not be perfect the you know let's say the small group that I join will also not be perfect right but but by committing myself to that right I'm committing myself to the maintenance um and the the ongoing uh uphold with upholding of godly community um and so that's number one. Number two is simply, right, like the, the guys I live with. I actually take, uh, I don't, not everyone has good relationships. I happen to be blessed with good relationships with the guys that I know um, uh, that I live with, but I take great pride in the fact that I don't just like sit in my room and ignore them, right? Mm -hmm. um, now it's really good for me that I don't do that. And it may be somewhat selfish that I don't do that because you know, otherwise I'll get really lonely during coronavirus really quickly. But like I specifically want to be um sp like going upstairs, you know, the our, my living room's upstairs, going upstairs and like spending time with them, whether that's you know, we're cooking a meal together or you know, we're working from home today or this sort of thing. Um being intentional about that. Other things are um, really, really, so this one's, so this one's the one that's sort of weird during coronavirus um, and the one that I ne haven't necessarily figured out uh, yet, but there's also a need to actively bring people into your life. Um, and what that means is like, <laughs> just shoot him a text, be like, hey, what are you doing tonight? Right? That, so a text like that does not just mean to someone, right? And you can, you know this because if someone texts you that, you can, you can understand all of this. Um, a, a text like that does not just mean, hey, um, like I, I'm bored, like let's, let's do something because like I, I need somebody around, right? A text like that means, hey, I value you and I want to spend time with you. Um, one of the great mistakes I think that you can make when pursuing friends uh, is to believe that friends owe you happiness. 
Um, and that, I know that because of the mistakes I made is I used to think that like friends were sort of people existed and friends ex friendships existed so that each person could make himself happy by having a friend. But, um, and that's completely wrong. Uh, the reason you have friends is so that you serve them. Um, so I, no, I'm not gonna say I take great pride in serving my friends, but like I see it as um, a responsibility incumbent upon me to like, to care for my friends because I have family and friends who care for me, right? And to not care for my friends would actually be <laughs> incredibly selfish. Now I am incredibly selfish, but I'm trying to be less incredibly selfish, you know? Um, so yeah, anyway. That's that's all really helpful. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious to ask next, like um, uh, sort of tying some of these threads together of, um, you know, you have your Twitter account and then I know you've been writing online recently mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> what are your plans or aspirations there in terms of how you're showing up online and trying to participate and, and uh, what, what, what are your plans there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the writing thing is, um, the writing thing is intentionally somewhat provocative. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that, so it's, it's a satirical, the, the website's rackabelt.com. And if you go there, you're going to find a lot of essays, which uh, I think the average person will either be somewhat confused by or, or dislike in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's sort of intentional um, because uh, good, healthy communities have people who make fun of it. Um, and while most of my, I, and I often find that, that I am the person who is willing to poke fun at absurdity because um, I simply am not so worried about who, I'm not so worried about causing offense that I'm not willing to do something that I think is sort of valuable. Um, I don't want to cause offense, but I don't mind people uh, reacting in, in negative ways, so long as um, so long as I have the chance to sort of point out what I was trying to do. Um, so that's sort of the point of the writing. Is satire is actually very healthy. It's, it's basically the long, the long and short of it. With my Twitter, I don't know. Um, my Twitter is is actually you know not necessarily. It's it's a piece of it shows pieces of who I am off for sure. Um, and, but on the other hand, it is not me. It, it is, it, it is various sides of me. And, and it is a good question, you know, to what extent do I actually use this to be funny? To what extent do I use this to encourage people? To what extent do I use this to, you know, be satirical in its own right about, you know, whether you say the post-rationalists or, you know, I'm, I'm adjacent to a lot of different Twitters. I'm adjacent to post-rationalist Twitter. I'm adjacent to Catholic Twitter, even though I'm Protestant. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, I'm adjacent to some conservative Twitter. Um, I'm adjacent to, so I'm adjacent to a, a lot of different sort of things. So the question is, how do I, how do I actually go about engaging? Uh, that's not really something that I figured out. And it's not something I never had a specific plan when I really started Twitter besides to sort of tweet and see what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't really changed that. Um, I'm gaining followers, which makes me nervous <laughs> because I think the key to doing really actually in any way being healthy on Twitter is actually not really caring too much about it. Um, because once you try to start, once once Twitter turns into a performance, rather than sort of a thing you're just kind of, I, my term is donking off. When, once you start performing on Twitter, rather than donking off, you start 
to run the risk of taking yourself too seriously. Mm. Um, and you start to run the risk of actually becoming just uninteresting if you're more, if that's a bigger concern to you. Um, so I'm gonna try at least that the one thing that I do know uh, about Twitter specifically is that I'm gonna do my very best to not take myself seriously um, and to really not think too much about it. Um, you know, there's there's only so much you can do to not think about Twitter, right? Because it is, you know, I think we don't can all, can all acknowledge it is addictive. But you can do, uh, there's a difference between having your attention taken up by it and having your psyche occupied by Twitter um, and having your psyche occupied by what people think about you on Twitter. Um, and so I'm doing my best to preserve my sanity by not caring too much so yeah yeah gotcha gotcha hmm. well it's interesting to hear about your plans for your own engagement or you know lack thereof just yeah. experimentation and exploration um i know you mentioned uh before this conversation in a direct message something that caught my interest of um Mm. you know, so sort of broader plans for humanity writ large. And you said uh, <laughs> something like uh, that you thought that there was like a, 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 correct me if I'm misremembering here, but like a spiritual obligation sure. to explore space. Uh, can you talk uh, about that? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, okay, hold on. Where is, uh, I'll bring this up real quick. So I wrote something on this. Um, and I'm just gonna, there's a quote from it that I want to bring up to you because I think that it summarizes the, uh, this pretty well. Let's see if I can find it. Give me one second, let's see, there it is. Um, okay, so this is a quote from <clears throat> C.S. Lewis's uh, book, Out of the Silent Planet. And if you haven't read it in a space trilogy, um, the three books are incredibly different from one another. And they're all really good. Um, I would recommend reading the last one if you're just going to read one. But if you want to read all three, uh, to the average listener, uh, they're all excellent books in their own right. Um, and if you are literally inclined, you can definitely see what he was thinking about or what he was reading because they're very similar to some of his contemporaries at the time. So they're really interesting. Anyway, let me read this real quick. Um, and then I'll sort of explain. So here's the quote. But Ransom, as time wore on, became aware of another and more spiritual cause for his progressive lightning in an exaltation of heart. A nightmare long engendered in the modern mind by the mythology that follows in the wake of science was falling off him. He had read of space at the back of his thinking for years had lurked the dismal fancy of the black cold vacuity the utter deadness which was supposed to separate the worlds. He had not known how much it affected him until now. Now that the very name space seemed a blasphemous libel for the Empyrean ocean of radiance in which they swam. He had thought it barren. He saw now that it was the womb of the worlds whose blazing and innumerable offspring looked down nightly, even upon the earth with so many eyes. And here, with how many more? No, space was the wrong name. Older thinkers had been wiser when they named it simply the heavens. Um, now, C.S. Lewis is sort of, he's imagining space as like a very particular thing in, in a spiritual context, like context of Christianity. Um, I think there's something, so there's two sides to this. Number one, I think there's something just true about space being better named the heavens. Um, I actually think that that the there there is little more spiritually calling than being out late at night in the middle of the country with basically no light pollution and just looking up into the sky. Mm. Um, there's something you you understand why our forefathers found the stars so compelling, right? And tried to derive meaning from them is because there's a certain, certain un, unimaginable beauty about how those things came into being. Um, 
and what they mean to us, both that they are so, that space and the expanse of the universe is so vast and, and we are so tiny, but also that, that we are said to be the most valuable things in the universe because God created us in his likeness, right? And, and that how magnificent is that, that in the midst of all this beauty, God values us. That, that's just, that, so that's, it just boggles my mind. Anyway, so there's that side. There's also in the American context, um, the American context is a lot of things, but the American context in terms of space is, is a couple of very specific things in my mind. Um, the American tradition of frontierism, um, which as all things are, uh, was both good and evil, right? Evil in the sense that, <laughs> you know, we did horrible, horrible things to the Native Americans and glorious and good as in the fact that to explore um, nature and to turn it to our own means uh, is good. Um, and it's sort of, in fact, what God has ordered us to do. Um, anyway, so there's that side. So there's the frontierism, but frontierism has been lost, actually. And I think uh, that the American spirit is often predicated on this idea of frontierism. And when the, when the frontier died, to some extent, the American spirit got stunted along with it. Uh, so there's that piece of Americanism. There's also the piece of Americanism, which is that uh, we have a great need for risk taking um, and a great need to do something. And in a society that is sort of, I, I don't know, we're too young of a society to understand the importance of, of culture creation and maintenance. Um, and what we need to do is we need to do uh, almost, we need to do, we need to be pushing the boundary somewhere, right? So we're very uncomfortable with staying within the boundaries um, and building up. Uh, we often feel like we need to be building out. And the last thing is that America is sort of aspirationally dead, right? There's not a huge amount of people who look to the future and say, there is hope um, and there is, there is great beauty in what in the possibility. And ironically enough, for all of his problems, Elon is sort of the only person left in America who actually makes people think that the future of that the future could be glorious. And not glorious in a sort of utopian way, right? Um, because that's that's when things get scary, when things get scary is when you people claiming for utopias, but glorious in the sense that there are great deeds to be done. And it's almost sort of a, a callback to the great origination of human society where mythology, which G.K. Chesterton sort of actually likes um, as a precursor to Christianity, uh, mythology is like this wistful thing where he says, uh, he says something to, I'm going to butcher this quote, but he says something that, that essentially uh, mythology is not these things were done, but a cry to ask why have these things not been done? And Elon is sort of the only person. And I think not uh, irrelevantly space, you know, the fact that Elon is involved in space, Elon is the only person that says, why can these great deeds not be done? Um, and that is something which <laughs> modernity in all of its foolishness is very close to losing and doesn't understand the problems of losing it, uh, doesn't, doesn't understand the ramifications upon, upon a culture's mentality when you lose the desire and the willpower to do great things. Um, bringing all this back into space, space ends up becoming not only the revival of the great American spirit, um, but becomes the revival of a religious uh, 
perhaps even spiritual. It sort of depends. I, I don't think, I think Christianity, because America, I think, is sort of fundamentally Christianity. Uh, I, I think that Christianity uh, is, is the main benefactor, but I, there's a certain power, a certain spiritual power to saying great deeds may still yet be done um, and pointing into the heavens and saying, this place which has captivated I mean, his fascination for so long, we can do, we can go. Uh, this is accessible. And to that extent, space may be the only place which is left to indulge that impulse, right? You know, typically in the past, that impulse gets indulged, right? If you look at the British Empire and imperialism, right? Or really any, there's a bunch of empires that you can look at, but this, you know, this impulse um, is often engaged uh, in imperialism or other destructive means, right? You know, Achilles, you know, or Caesar, or all of these typical, you know, all these great figures in history have this question on why cannot great deeds be done, but they come at, you know, in the sacrifice of blood and great loss of human life. And to its credit, society is no longer willing, well, well currently no longer willing, uh, you know, 100 years down the line, who knows? I have no great faith in human society to not regress to such conditions in the future. But to its credit, human society has sort of said, has sort of agreed upon, if not put into practice, the idea that these things are not okay. The place where great deeds can be done without great loss of life is in incredibly dangerous, and, and I sort of embrace danger as a necessary component of spiritual revival to some extent. Space is the great place where great works can be done without needing to sacrifice people uh, on mass. And so that is sort of where I think why space ends up becoming this really interesting place um, where I, I don't think you see people being like, what are the economic benefits for you know pushing humanity or pushing the United States into space? And I don't think there are there will be economic benefits at some point. I don't have a problem being like you know there's there's this thing and this thing and this thing, but I really do think that the cultural and spiritual revival that comes with something like that is almost necessary in a modern culture which is in danger of losing um, everything that made it. So that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Um... Thank you for sharing all that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's something really um, beautiful and true and inspiring in the way that you're talking about that and also other things. And also at the same time, I know um, for myself, just coming from a, a very different place where, um, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, with space in particular, I have, I have concerns about going to space and uh, sure. humanities as a species and uh, things like that. <laughs> and then, and then you know, in any of the um, particular, that, that's sort of a shape of a thing, of a response where I'm like, wow, there's mm -hmm. something really compelling here. And I have reservations or concerns or curiosities. And that shape, um, I, I, I see that coming up pretty consistently with a lot of the things that you're talking about um, in response where mm -hmm. I'm like, Mm, there's something compelling and beautiful here and it doesn't quite fit with other things that I'm also seeing. And sure. um, I'm curious how, mm, oh, so I, I think to me in where I'm coming from, there's a sense of um, to move forward socially and culturally, mm -hmm. people like ourselves need to be having dialogues where those bridges are like the distance between um, cultural and political and spiritual ideas and ideals are uh, acknowledged and then discussed and that there are bridges made between them. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, like, like that that's the, that's the way forward to, because, because humanity, you know, there, there's such disparate views on so many things and the, there, there's a mm -hmm. lot of fracturing and fragmentation from what I can see. And 
Um, I'm curious how, well, if that brings up anything for you and, and how you sort of, um, I, I guess the question is like how you go about uh, like productive disagreement or productive conversations uh, mm. about around these kinds of issues where, you know, um, uh, the, the answers aren't clear. There, there's, there's gems or jewels of, of things that can come and yet it's not clearly established yet. How do you, how do you approach that personally? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I have, uh, personally, I've not always been great with this because my typical way to get people to talk about things has usually been, uh, let me be a little, let me find a way to, to this is my personal life. Uh, I used to find ways to say things that I knew would trigger conversation and usually by like being sarcastic or making jokes about things and then uh, people will leave to defend themselves and eventually discourse will get started, but you know, maybe people weren't super happy with me all the time. Uh, so <laughs> that's my that's my background. Uh, and you can probably see that in my, if anyone's read my writing, you can probably understand mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> how, I've, how I've done that. Uh, <laughs> so, Okay, so I think um, this is a difficult question because I have two distinct impulses here. On one hand, I think that you're, you're somewhat right. I think that people must strive for understanding uh, and Understanding is, especially in, especially in the age of nuclear weapons, uh, understanding is crucial. Um, indeed, all human advancement, well, not all human advancement, most human advancement comes when a collective of, a human collective, or that human collective is not the right word, uh, a, uh, a a collection of relatively diverse but similar skill level people come together and start working, right? Like whether it be the impressionists or whether it be, you know, the people who developed the nuclear bomb, right? You need, you need a variety of people. Uh, so you're right. Um, progress does require as much as I hate to give one to the wokes, progress does require diversity. Uh, you know, the question obviously becomes how do you define diversity, but to some extent you do need a diverse group of people. Um, so there's, there's a problem here though, right? The question is if you don't understand yourself fully, which you don't, right? Uh, as, as Freud would, <laughs> Freud would argue, uh, and as I think marriage might prove, uh, how can you hope to understand other people? Um, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure it is, it is impossible to entirely understand other people, but it is possible to engage with other people in shared frameworks. Um, and I sort of believe that Christianity is actually the best way to do this. Um, it is the, it, Christianity to some extent was the driving force in the West for the, the idea that each person has value. Um, you know, I'm not gonna speak to the Eastern tradition because to be completely honest, I'm not that familiar with it. Um, and I'm sure you could talk much more extensively on it, but at least in Europe and then, you know, driving into America, sort of this idea of the individual has contained a spark of divinity is, is really powerful because what that means when you have to deal with other people 
um, as I think C.S. Lewis says somewhere, is you have to understand that each person, um, you know, not in this life, but the next will be an will be more beautiful than an angel, right? Uh, and you need to treat them with that sort of respect. And so the way that you end up um, encouraging people to actually work together comes from a moral understanding of the world uh, and a moral understanding of humanity as, as warped, but to also understand that yourself is warped and therefore not to hold yourself higher than other people. The reverse side of that and where I am not sure, um, so I actually am not sure about this myself, um, but where I might say that I am anti-cooperation, which is surprising because I haven't really talked to be honest with you about being anti-cooperation to this point um is i think to some extent you can have when you try to do too much you can end up losing a sense of identity um within a small community within a culture within a nation whatever and when you lose concepts of identity by going too far and trying to dissolve all boundaries between human beings, what you end up getting is, uh, is meaninglessness. And that ends up becoming a real problem. Now, it's really easy for me to idealize, right, and say, oh, if only I could make everyone a Christian and therefore distinctions between people wouldn't matter because we would all just be you know, brothers and sisters under Christ, and um, we could all get along together super well. That's great. Uh, I am, that would <laughs> that'd be wonderful. It's never going to happen. Uh, it, and there's no use in me pretending that the world can become that which it ought to be now. Uh, so there's no use in stripping people of their cultural identities or backgrounds in order to make them more able to communicate with other people from other cultural communities and backgrounds. Um, and furthermore, it is often the differences between people which makes human society so beautiful and so, and so flourishing. Um, it's the interactions between people with different things to offer. So, so the question isn't necessarily, I think, to me, how do we make pe different people from different cultures uh, more the same? It ends up becoming, how do we encourage a base level of communication so that we can maintain differences while making those differences complementary? Um, that I think, I don't have a good answer to that question. That is a really, that is a very, very, very difficult line to try to stay on top of. It's very, I mean, the story of human history is going from one extreme to the other uh, and causing and wreaking havoc on the way. Um, That is a political, cultural, economic, and religious question all tied up in one. I don't think there's a good answer. I think you can try to do the best that you can, um, but humans are sort of broken in a way that makes the best you can do probably functional rather than good. Um, and so when you see a system that does this well, I, I think that, for example, a good example of this system might be something like federalism. And a very good example of a system like this might be taking a look at a country like Switzerland, where you can go from one valley to another. People will speak completely different languages. They work 
as a country, they work beautifully well as a country. It's a, it's, it's a very well functioning state, but it, and it maintains cohesiveness without sacrificing the autonomy and the beauty of the differences within the communities that make it up. Um, you know, obviously, like not every country is <laughs> going to copy Switzerland because there's some very unique characteristics there. But um, I think something like federalism is a good example of a political structure which does this in a not perfect way, but in a sufficient way. So that's a very long rambling answer, but I, I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, uh... It makes me curious to ask, like, um, mm. well, it, it, I think there's there's sort of two sides to the, this line of questioning. One is a, a sort of microcosm of me as a person engaging mm -hmm. with you as a person of the sense that there's yeah. mutual respect and coming from different places. Um, mm -hmm. And then a sort of macro level of uh, a concern for society writ large and the planet mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, global scale um, or uh, interstellar scale. Um, and um, I'm, I'm curious really about both of those angles of uh, mm -hmm. how to engage here in this conversation. And then also, you know, you piqued my curiosity towards the end about um, something that I've been curious about for some time is uh, uh, like the possibility of and merits or demerits of say global government. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to me that something like um, just, just from where I'm coming from, this is just me, sure. but that, um, that something like uh, a global government would be needed to resolve some of the problems that we're facing because they're, they're planetary at scale and not local. Um, and, and that mm -hmm. that would probably require something like um, what you're talking about of, of different nations becoming similar to like states that are uh, cooperating with each other and uh, have differences, but also enough in common that they can uh, legislate and trade and uh, interact mm -hmm. in beneficial ways. And I know that it's a bit of a controversial idea. Some people don't like it or want a totally different model uh, that, that like, you know, there are different governance structures that are proposed. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what your, um, on the on the macro level of what your, which, you know, even asking this question is also already the micro level as sure. well, but for, from where yeah, you're sure. coming from, is that is that crazy good, uh amazing yeah. different bad yeah uh so on the micro level between you and me um obviously like i think i just like talking to people <laughs> you know like yeah. we're friendly like all all it takes is being friendly to someone like mm. even someone who Beautiful. dislikes you often you can just convince them to maybe at the worst case dislike you a little less and at the best case become friendly to you back simply by um by showing good faith uh, so now that is not that, <laughs> that is not the case with everyone uh there are definitely people out there who who are maybe not good people and maybe even when you're nice to them uh you know they they won't reciprocate uh but i often find um I don't know if you follow Altina, uh, but Altina does this basically better than, than anyone on Twitter. She just is, she just wants to be friends uh, and she'll be super open about that fact and she'll just be friendly to you and it's really fantastic. Uh, and as someone who, you know, maybe I haven't come across in this conversation, but I'm, I'm decently cynical. Uh, I think that it, it is always refreshing and even a little surprising to see complete strangers just be friendly with one another than, than become friends because they just happen to be friendly. And I don't really think that everything is, so, so things are actually incredibly simple at the micro level, where it is primarily just kindness uh that you need right the 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 problem sense of this will be, come to the macro question the problems come when you start to blow things up right when you're doing look look problems between you and your spouse are incredibly complex and probably and also pretty simple right 
those problems problems compound as you draw them out into larger and larger scales. So let's say global governance. I imagine, for example, uh, one of the things that you think that probably go, you know, a, a universal government might be helpful for would probably be something like climate change. Definitely. Um, so, so I'll say like a first order thing about things like climate change is I, one of the things with climate change that I believe uh, people who are terrified of it, I think it pro, I, it exists. And I think that it is headed in the wrong direction. Um, one of the things that people who are terrified of climate change get wrong is the sheer ability of humans to pull it out at the last moment. <laughs> um, and given the resources and given the technology that we have at our disposal, I am surprised that more people don't be like, or, or aren't doing something like, this is bad, but people will figure out the solution. Um, you know, we fix the ozone is a, is a good example. Uh, but, but even more than that, um, look how quickly we came up with a vaccine for this global pandemic, shockingly quickly. Um, what it took was, uh, as Schoolhouse Rock would say, uh, mother necessity is, is, the, is the mother of all invention. And I would be shocked if when we start to experience real effects, that we don't come up with really effective and good solutions for it very quickly, whether that be you know, methods of controlling how much sunlight comes to our atmosphere or controlling the thickness of the atmosphere itself or, you know, a variety of different options like that. Um, I would be surprised were, let's use the word geoengineering, uh, didn't get invented and become a very mature profession very quickly um, when things start to come to a head. Um, so, so I think on a problem now that, you know, that of course, look, that is like one of may, maybe many reasons why advocates of a universal government might say that a universal government would be helpful. Um, so obviously I'm not addressing all concerns here, but that's a concern. And I think the solution or a point against that is, look, you're simply underselling humanity's survival instinct. Okay, so many people have written persuasively about the problem with the universal government. I have not read many of them. And so my response is going to be very much me sort of uh, talking from my intuitions and from my impulses. My response is basically a universal government is uh, probably the most effective way at destroying uh, the conception of human complexity. Um, what I mean by that is when you start to think about something like universal government, what you inevitably do, there's a couple of things that happen. What inevitably happens is the people who rise to power are not the people who you want in power. And those people are very, very effective bureaucrats and um, very, very persuasive politicians. Those people are necessary to the running of a government, but they're not good. And the reason that they're not good is because the bureaucrats are people who, much like scientists, try to flatten the human experience into something which is understandable 
by this artificial creation that we call the state. And it's very, look, uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not dunking on the state, I'm not an anarchist. I think the state is incredibly important and incredibly useful. But bureaucrats are there to flatten the human experience into, uh, into, into documents. Uh, now, the way that you mitigate that is you make bureaucracy uh, touchable to the average person. So, and now this is a very conservative and, and in some cases actually very liberal idea, but, but this is why when you institute government, um, it is good to put as much power as you can locally, like in a, in a township. And the reason for that is that um, what ends up happening is when you make the government accessible to the people who it affects, people can actually see who it is that is affecting their lives and are motivated in order to either get involved or to change it or to control it in some way. Now, when you institute a universal government, you are literally putting the mechanisms of power as far away from people as you can. Even more dangerously, what ends up happening when you establish it is universal government can only really rule from two positions, which it will occupy simultaneously. Number one, it will occupy a place of military power, right? Because to some extent, all governments must have control of force if they are to be effective, right? Um, it's unfortunate, you know, you wish you could have a government which like <laughs> didn't need to have military. Uh, it's simply just not really an option given the state of human nature. The second thing that you need, um, and the reason that a universal government would be administered is because, well, not a universal, a global government would be administered is because of a moral existential calling. The worst and most dangerous form of government is that which claims the moral high ground. Government should or ought to sort of serve as an institution which tries to serve, right? And, and to that purpose, it is not a moral arbiter. It is, it is a, um, a useful structure in some sense, right? It, it's much more complicated than that, but it's, it's a good way to think about it for the purposes of how I'm trying to frame it. When you get a universal government in place, what happens is, and for the reasons that we might do it, uh, its purpose and its reason for existing becomes moral. It therefore can never be wrong and therefore can never doubt itself because it must be right about whatever it does. Um, so we have, we have a couple of things. We have a government which must be right because it was founded for morally good purposes. So it cannot doubt itself. We have a government which has, power, which has capability for force and we have a government which is incredibly separated from the people who it, it is trying to protect. Those things to me seem like an inevitable disaster. Hmm. I don't believe, now look, coordination of, between states um, in order to prevent ourselves from nuclear annihilation, to try to mitigate cold warming, really kind of whatever. Those are very important things. And I think those are things that are worth thinking about and considering. Quite simply, a global government is a overly simplistic answer 
It, it is a way to try to make the level of difficulty in solving existential human problems at a level which does not actually, a level of complexity which does not actually fit those problems. Hmm. Uh, it is simply the easiest available option. And so people want to default to it because it's, it's a very understandable how it would work. And to be honest with you, it's probably the easiest thing to do anyways. I have great sympathy with that idea, right? Sometimes what you need to do is you just need to do something and maybe it's not perfect, but something just needs to happen. I have great sympathy for that. I see the foundations upon which a universal government might be founded as, a, as essentially flawed, like a, a combination of the worst ways or the most, not the worst, the most potentially dangerous ways that a government might be formed or the things which a universal or global government would be formed. And for that reason, there are great benefits which may be achievable, but given the risks and the dangers, I think that it would be much better to try to solve these matters um, in more complex and probably more difficult ways because my intuition becomes things will, will get out of control very quickly. Um, uh, because people who will end up in places like this uh, are not, right, it's not like your local mayor who like really cares about Stacy and how she's doing. What they care is about power and importance and the human lives often and quality of human lives often come second to create moral undertakings. Um, and so that gives me great pause for concern where we end up talking about something like that. So. Mm. 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 That'll make sense. That'll make sense. Um, well, I love, I love what you had to say about both the micro and the macro level. So thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Um, yeah. Um, is there anything, uh, there's a little bit of a, um, how to put it, um, um, yeah, since just, hmm, is there anything that this conversation has brought up that you want to explore that feels like adjacent to the topics that we've been talking about? That is a, that's a very, that's a very good question. I hadn't thought about it. Um, well, I suppose I'm sort of interested to hear you know, I don't mind a, a bit of uh, a bit of difference. I'm suppo I suppose I'm interested to hear sort of what you think about where you think your uh, instinctual agreements and disagreements come with some of the things that I'm saying. Because uh, I, I am actually interested. You know, I don't much to my own chagrin. I don't <laughs> I don't know as much as I would like to about your tradition, and so I'm curious to hear where you disagree or uh, or agree and, and why that is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, I think um, for one, although I grew up in a like Christian adjacent uh, tradition and, you know, mm -hmm. grew up in a Christian culture, I'm not a Christian. I'm a, you know, like Buddhist, Taoist person doing my own thing to some extent, but um, really resonate mm -hmm. with those traditions. And then similarly, um, Oh, well, I don't know. Politics has been a, a really confusing thing for a long time. And mostly, frankly, yeah. I avoid it, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but have a little bit of a, a allergy to like, well, like a respect for and allergy for conservatism, I'd say. And then, sure. um, and then similarly, um, I guess on these last points about like space and, um, human flourishing of like humans being able to find like say technological solutions just in time. Mm -hmm. um, while that seems astute, um, like, yeah, I, humans are really good at that. But to me, that seems like part of the problem uh, because, mm. um, oh, with, with like global warming and climate change, uh, mm. Mm, I'm concerned about the planet and other species and animals and plants mm. uh, as much as if not more than humans like yeah humans are really good at figuring things out for themselves and yet we're 
uh, hurting the planet in ways that seem evil to me and uh, irreparable uh, to some extent of like, you know, we're causing species to go extinct at ever increasing rates. And those, um, you know, we're like, I think we're like murdering beings, basically individuals and then also species. And so even if we like solve things for ourselves, that still seems um, uh, immoral to me, basically. And so, so I, I, yeah, I should add in here mm -hmm. that uh, it is a, I think it is a great sort of failure of, um, of American Christianity to not take more seriously the responsibility to steward creation well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that does, I think you're right, that does pop up more, well, obviously it pops up more conservatism because conservatism is less worried about the environment. Um, uh, I, I would agree with you, although I obviously I'm, I will not go so far as you uh, in to say that I, I do wish, and I, I don't really, the reason I don't really have an answer for this because I, I, well, the reason that I don't have an answer for this is because I don't have an answer for this. I do wish uh, that there were more, there was a better theological, uh, a better expressed theological framework for Christians to talk about the, the responsibility of the stewardship of creation. So anyway, sorry. Sorry, I apologize for interrupting you. Please, please continue. Oh, no, no problem. You weren't interrupting me. Um, it, it does remind me that I think that some of that, at least as in my own understanding and reflections of it, that does seem somewhat, um, it seems to be at least partially attributable to, yeah, like Christian theology and the mm -hmm. Christian tradition of like, yeah, like interpretations of Genesis of um, mm -hmm. like the way that the humanities relationship to the planet and other species is conceived is um, intrinsically, um, oh, I, I would say like speciesist essentially of like privileging mm -hmm. humanity over animals and plants and the planet in a way that even, even the word stewardship is already like including a hierarchy there that I think mm -hmm. invites the kind of um, uh, thinking structures that cause the actions that we're seeing where it's like, um, uh, we don't value plants or animals or the planet for the sake of themselves as living beings, essentially. And I think we need mm -hmm. to make that kind of a shift at this time where we see um, other forms of life as, as, as life and living beings and worthy of respect and care and uh, not, because um, essentially we see them as like objects or material or resources or, um, things like this and that's that that kind of thinking causes the behaviors that we're seeing that I see as immoral and and cruel and um sure. uh, it's not acceptable to me yeah yeah no that makes sense uh this is an interesting question for you I suppose um on the question of, of the hierarchical uh the placing of things in hierarchies in order to take care of them. This is sort of, for example, I think the hierarchy of power in a family is actually incredibly necessary to the proper raising of children. Um, mm -hmm. So while- Just to be clear, child, I, I don't, Yeah, let me just interrupt you yeah, for yeah. a second. I don't have a problem yeah, yeah. with hierarchy as such. Like I've okay, seen okay. hierarchies being Got useful it. in families. Like I was in a monastery for many years and like hierarchy oh, yeah, is very sure. useful okay. there. Um, cool. Cool, cool, cool. But but this kind of hierarchy I see is um, mm -hmm. uh, it's inviting just the, the kind okay, of cool. problems that we're seeing, or at least yeah, that I'm seeing. Sweet. No, okay. That's what that's sort of what I was trying to ask, basically. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's it's kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a word that is just associated with like a lot of people are just like, oh, all hierarchy is bad, and yeah, that's not me. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, but, for sure. But. Um, but I think that seeing human and humans as intrinsically better than other species is mm -hmm. is is highly problematic and mistaken, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, and 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 leads to in vast injustice. So um, that's that's the specific thing that I'm responding to. Sure. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, I don't think this is a, um, I don't think this is a place that we're going to agree upon. Uh, sure. You know, very theologically, uh, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, humans are the ones who are listed who are said to be creating God's image, and mm -hmm. um, so there are obviously theological differences that are the 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 center here, which you know, which are, will not be overcome. But I can respect, and I can totally understand where you might see. Uh, where you see injustice um, and where where some areas where we ought to be doing better, even if I don't agree with uh, mm -hmm. with the foundations of where you're, where you're coming across with that practicality, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, maybe just to add like, um, it, it does make sense that there's theological differences there, but just from an entirely practical mm -hmm. perspective, it's um, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to abuse other species or the planet in this way because it's shooting ourselves in the mm -hmm. foot uh, just for humans to to be yeah. having the kinds of relationship to the planet that we're having. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, we'll like pull out, as you say, you know, we'll probably figure out technological solutions, but the root causes of that, I think, are in are related to that. Yeah, I should, I think I probably ought to clarify something. I don't think that, that the, the correct answer is uh, simply, uh, <laughs> simply picking around and until, until, until we figure it out sure, sure. <laughs> yeah no but but i i will say that that uh that things like let's i'll i'll specify the climate change because it's uh it's maybe not the simplest topic but it's the easiest it's the one people will be most familiar with is is the the problem is not so great that we require um a universal government to solve it mm. uh the problem is there and we ought to try to solve it anyways um we ought not to dick around <laughs> um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but but i think that, that oftentimes the scale of the problem in relation to human ingenuity is not so great that that our such a risk like universal government must be taken uh mm -hmm. i think i think it's the best way i think that's the best way to put to put to summarize sort of my belief on that front if that makes sense yeah yeah it definitely makes sense uh, it makes sense and oh i'm just appreciating like I, I think there's a lot of clarity there and while uh we are coming from different places it's given me a lot of food mm -hmm. for thought and reflection and i think it's it behooves us to uh to to wrestle with these things and to articulate how we see them and understand how others see them and because we need to figure something out and the way that we're doing things yeah. isn't working. So I appreciate the clarity that you're bringing to it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Can I also say, I appreciate that you use the word behoove because I, that's a great word. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's appropriate here. Um, yeah. It behooves you greatly to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Nice job. <laughs> Good work. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, well, I so enjoyed this conversation, Teddy, and I'm really glad that uh, we're connected and uh, that you're doing the things that you're doing. And I, I look forward to kindly disagreeing with you in the future. Thank you so much, brother. I've really enjoyed this conversation. This has been great. Mm, wonderful.